Hello, welcome back to another video essay. My name is Elena Bilizari for those of you who haven't come across my channel before. Thank you so much to everybody who subscribed recently. Um, it really means a lot that people actually want to listen to what I have to say. So thank you so much for watching. Um, I've linked my Instagram now. This is a big thing for me because I'm really scared of social media presences. Like here I am literally with a YouTube channel, but um, I'm literally terrified of what people think of me on social media and I'm also like scared of what my employees will think of me. Um, so my Instagram was private for a really, really long time, but I've taken the big step and <laughs> um, I will put it in the description if anybody wants to follow me. Thank you to everyone who already has and who's sent me messages. It's really, really sweet. Um, sorry about the delay since last video. I, I've literally been wanting to make this video for so long I mean it's not that long but for ages it feels like ages so I started getting really interested in this topic and I scripted it but then I had so many deadlines for uni that I had to be self-controlled and tell myself no I have to wait until my <laughs> until after my deadline but now I can finally do it um I'm really excited so I hope you enjoy it as much as I have enjoyed researching it I wanted to talk a bit about um, right-wing extremism and I guess just polarization and I started thinking about this video because I saw Dr. Shola Moss's Instagram post where she showed a letter containing death threats which she'd received from the National Action London cell. I don't know if anyone follows her but the letter contains some really graphic violent and racist language which i was really shocked to hear i guess i'm privileged enough to forget that people this filled with hate exist and live amongst us even now but um i started wondering how a person like that even becomes so full of hate whether they're born like that or whether they have family members who influence them at a young age or whether they just become radicalized later on in life and i'm not sure if radicalized is the right word to use because i was talking to my friend and he was saying that in in portuguese radicalized is for the left and e extreme extremized extreme Oh my gosh, here I am again, not knowing how to pronounce things on my channel. <laughs> um, extreme is for the right, for the left, for the right and radicalized is for the left. But I'm just going to use radicalized for the sake of this video. So if it's wrong, then I'm really sorry. But um, I was then recommended a podcast by a friend called The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, which became honestly the first podcast I've ever binged, just as you would with like any TV show. I listened to all of the episodes that were out at the time in just over a day. And now that they've been coming out, I've been listening to more. Um, and as the producer of the show talked to J.K. Rowling, lawyers, trans activists and both critics and supporters of J.K. Rowling herself, I really started to gain an idea of how progressive movements can really push away people from our social groups and towards extreme radicalization. I will revisit this topic later in the video, but for now let's just define what is meant by right-wing extreme. Maura Conway, Ryan Scrivens and Logan McNair wrote a paper called Right-Wing Extremists, Persistent Online Presence, History and Contemporary Trends, which provides a useful explanation of what we mean by the term right-wing extremists. Right-wing extremists structure their beliefs on the basis that the success and survival of the in-group is inseparable from the negative acts of the out-group, and in turn, they are willing to assume both an offensive and defensive stance in the name of the success and survival of the in-group. We thus conceptualize Western right-wing extremism as a racially, ethnically, and or sexually defined nationalism, which is typically framed in terms of white power and or white identity, i.e. the in-group that is grounded in xenophobic and exclusionary understandings of the perceived threats posed by some combination of non-whites, Jews, Muslims, immigrants, refugees, members of the LGBTQIA community and feminists, i.e. the outgroups. But the question that lingers is, how does somebody go from an innocent, altruistic and compassionate child into a right-wing extremist often filled with so much hatred? I've developed a hypothesis explaining the creation of right-wing extremists based on my own observation and research. I'm not sure if hypothesis is the right word to use or thesis. I did learn this in my uni course, but I guess I didn't pay enough attention. I hope it's hypothesis. Anyway, starting off with dissatisfaction or disillusionment with the current political climax or current ideas, and then the proliferation of fake news, which creates a scapegoat. Thirdly, lack of debate or feelings of isolation which lead to defensiveness and further entrenches right-wing extreme views. And lastly, humour as a tool to soften the extreme views which are being endorsed. 
You can really see this process in this beautiful graph made by me, which shows the four different factors, disillusionment, fake news, lack of debate and humour through the rise of Bolsonarismo, Trumpism, Covid denies or anti-vaxxers, White Lives Matter movements and the rise of extreme right in the UK and tightening immigration policy. We can really see this process of dissatisfaction followed by the blaming of a scapegoat and proliferation of fake news throughout history. I guess we all know a lot about World War II and Nazis and Hitler, um, especially if you grew up in England, it's literally the only thing I heard about in my history lessons. Um, so I won't talk about it too much, but the process of disillusionment with the government and the dissatisfaction with the political climax is really evident in that example following the Treaty of Versailles, which left Germany hugely in debt. Um, and then the fake news creating a scapegoat with Hitler blaming the Jews for all of the economic problems that Germany was going through. Um, I might be a bit biased because this is my degree, but I think that Latin America is a really interesting example in this case and can teach us a lot about the rise of the extreme right. Uh, so in Brazil, uh, João Goulart, who was the incumbent president at the time, faced really strong criticism from the military and the right for supposed communist sympathies and was deposed by the military coup in 1964. And then for two decades following, the dictatorship openly declared a war on subversives and institutionalised torture. This time period also saw thousands of political arrests, the disappearance of at least 144 victims by government forces, and the deaths of 195 people at the hands of the state. The 60s and the 80s saw a great deal of social change in Brazil, with new technology which revolutionised communication, especially through the proliferation of television, and the Catholic Church underwent a very public split between conservatives and progressives. The pill also became available after 1962, and women entered the workplace in large numbers. And as a result of this pushback to this change, right-wing intellectuals implemented hardline authoritarianism and repression as a reaction against modernity and emergent social and moral changes, which they interpreted as signs and symptoms of a communist-inspired collapse. Lucy Ginoronha Guarani wrote in a letter to a prominent reactionary general that we are witnessing at the moment an attempt to destroy our moral principles, particularly in the hearts of our youth, by means of dangerous philosophies that exalt the erotic and the perverse and seek to break the ties that link young people to their past and to their families. And she also said that our young people are being communized, perverted and turned against their parents, even in the Catholic schools and churches. The use of morality and religion fear-mongered the Brazilian population and created a moral panic in which people genuinely thought that they were on the brink of a descent into full-blown communism. In this case, the scapegoat was the LGBT plus community, feminists, progressive Christians who endorsed liberation theology, young people who engaged in youth counterculture, hippies and essentially anyone who were the right-wing intellectuals considered to be deviants. And to me, the patterns that I just discussed are very obvious in today's current politics. When you think back to the moral panic of the 1960s and the 80s in Brazil, it's sad to think that 60 years later, the same narrative is being pushed by rightists in Brazil with the rise of Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro's campaign was rooted in the same authoritarian and repressive narratives, conflating left-wing progressiveness with delinquency, degeneracy, sexual radicalism and the destruction of the family. And language is used in a particularly dangerous manner in order to frame the debate as a war with goodies and baddies. Moralistic language creating us versus them dynamics and good versus evil approaches have been used by numerous politicians and can be clearly observed in this clip of Bolsonaro's wife who is preaching that the government office has been consecrated to demons. É uma briga do bem, é uma guerra do bem contra o mal. Mas eu creio que nós vamos vencer porque Jesus já venceu na cruz do Calvário por nós. Porque por muitos anos, por muito tempo, aquele lugar foi um lugar consagrado a demônios. Consagrados a demônios, cozinha consagrada a demônios, planalto consagrado a demônios e hoje consagrado ao Senhor Jesus. James O'Keefe, the former leader of the far-right group Project Veritas, also used this language, describing his team as an army of journalists in his new project, the Uber of Journalism. But in response, we are going to build an army of investigators and exposers. They have awakened a sleeping giant. I'm back. 
so weird. Why is he dancing? <laughs> These are clear manipulation tactics designed to put followers into flight mode where they'll defend their viewpoint at all costs rather than being open to listening and discussing other perspectives. This is the part of the video where my views start to get a bit more nuanced so I just want to make it really clear that I am open to changing my mind and to engage in a respectful discussion with anyone in the comment section. I just, I think these videos are really made to challenge, I mean I really want to challenge myself with them to see other points of view and to perhaps share perspectives that aren't very mainstream so um, please don't think that I necessarily even, no I do mean everything I say. <laughs> Um, but I am willing to change my mind if anybody wants to be, yeah, if anybody wants to engage in a debate with me in the comment section, as I have done before in all of my other videos. Please don't cancel me. How do you know what's good for me? That's my opinion! So, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I recently started listening to a podcast called The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling, which I found to be a very thought-provoking podcast, and it provided me with some really different perspectives than what I would generally be exposed to. And the show deals with themes of cancel culture and explores the lead up to Rowling's controversial tweets which caused her to be cancelled. As I listened to each episode, I realised that I could understand points of view that I never thought I'd be able to previously. I listened to each person share their experiences and perspectives and I found myself being able to nod and be like, yeah, they have a point. And I think that in this day and age, this is something quite rare, at least in my own experience. When it comes to issues like gender and race, these issues are not in any way black and white and nuance is really imperative to these discussions. When I was reading Invisible Women over the summer, Criado Perez talks in chapter 2 about how gender neutral toilets often have disproportionate downsides for cisgender women. As she describes that, when you have gender neutral toilets with cubicles and gender neutral toilets with urinals, cisgender women are unable to use urinals whereas cis men can use both. In the case highlighted at the beginning of the chapter, she describes a real life scenario in which the queue for the gender neutral toilet with cubicles was significantly longer, and since the queue was occurring during the interval of a show, many women could make it to the toilet without missing the next act. And this causes real problems, as Criado Perez illustrates with studies in Canada and Britain linking the rise in referrals for urinary tract infections, problems with distended bladders and a range of other gynecological problems to toilet closure. Criado Perez's thesis in Invisible Women is that, as suggested by Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, women are defined as relative to men. Humanity is male and men are the subject and absolute and women are merely other. Invisible Women explains how this causes a huge gender data gap. The positing of maleness as absolute and femaleness as other means that gender neutral language can be dangerous and dismissive of issues that only those assigned female at birth deal with. To say this is not synonymous with transphobia or bigotedness, you can support a movement whilst being wary of possible issues that will inevitably come up. I think the problem that I've observed is that we don't often allow for these niches, we don't allow for discussion and disagreement. As I mentioned in my previous video, often our discourse sounds like if you don't agree with me on this very niche and polemic issue that is cultural appropriation, you are racist. And social media only exacerbates this, as our communication often takes place in the form of a picture or a 15 second video or a 250 character tweet. Honestly, I think the biggest mistake that Rowling made was tweeting an extremely diluted version of her views rather than taking part in an interview or posting an essay, which to be fair, she later did. Tweets don't encourage a thoughtful weighing up of different viewpoints to reach a conclusion, they just encourage immediate reactions and judgments. So when people like Rowling take to Twitter or another social media site to share their perspectives which sit outside of the mainstream view, they're often faced with anger, bitterness and resentment, and rightfully so, as often their words can be hurtful. But when we leave out rational debate and simply point fingers, I think we often isolate people from our movements and people who otherwise would be on board. So after listening to the podcast, I grew really curious about this issue. So I created a Twitter account and I stalked the shit out of Rowling. Um, and something that I found really disheartening was this following tweet from one of her supporters. The trans movement is anti-woman. Men in dresses scream and demand to be in women's spaces. And if real women push back, we're harassed, threatened and degraded. JK Rowling gets daily threats for standing up for biological women. This movement hates women. I don't know whether this woman has always had this view, but I do think that the more we shut people off from our movements, the angrier they become and the more likely they are to agree when they see perspectives like the one of Abby Johnson. If JK Rowling is getting 
threats from people who are meant to be progressive, how are we supposed to defend the values on which our movements stand? The Hands Across the Aisle Coalition is the prime example to me of what happens when we attempt to shut off important discussions and listen to nuanced criticisms of our mainstream views. So this coalition is an organisation founded, founded in 2017 and it's known for its opposition to trans rights. It aims to connect anti-trans radical feminists with conservative Christian anti-LGBT groups, ostensibly tabling their ideological differences to oppose gender identity ideology. The organisation actively supports anti-LGBT groups in legislation targeting transgender rights. In May 2017, the Hands Across the Isle Coalition co-signed a petition with the anti-LGBT American College of Pediatricians and leaders of other anti-LGBT groups such as the Family Policy Alliance, Concerned Women for America and the Texas Eagle Forum. I'm not arguing that we should embrace anti-trans radical feminists and their views. I simply believe that if we do not listen to the views of feminists who have concerns about the trans movement, they will become more and more radical until they're anti-trans and then they join groups like the Hands Across the R Coalition, which is also anti-abortion and anti-LGBT as a whole. And once someone engages with something like anti-trans ideology, it's only a matter of time before they can become fully radicalised into right-wing extremism, thanks to social media algorithms. A really interesting study published in 2021 found that TikTok's algorithm leads users from transphobic videos to far-right rabbit holes. Media Matters created a new TikTok account and engaged only with content that they identified as transphobic, and this included accounts that posted multiple videos which degraded trans people, insisting that there are only two genders or mocking the trans experience. And even though they solely interacted with transphobic content, they found that their For You page was increasingly populated with videos promoting various far-right views and talking points, including misogynistic content, racist and white supremacist content, anti-vaccine videos, anti-Semitic content, ableist narratives, conspiracy theories, hate symbols, and videos including general calls to violence. Once the process of far-right radicalization has begun, often users will migrate from social media sites like TikTok and Twitter, which remove content that violates community guidelines, to sites like Telegram, 4chan, 8chan, Parler, Truth Social, Gabe, Gab, I don't know, Gabe, Gab, Getter and Rumble. And these sites use double-end encryption, which is why they are so popular amongst far-right groups and why they've also been used by terrorist organisations like the Islamic State. Yeah. This graph shows US political communities in Telegram as of February 2022. The colours represent different communities identified in the analysis and each individual point represents a single channel. As you can see, the big groups include Nick Fuentes, an American white supremacist political commentator and live streamer who apparently wants to be an incel for life. It's, you know, oh, you haven't had sex. It's like, well, I haven't chosen to do that yet. You know, I'm choosing instead to be an historical figure. I'm choosing instead to leave an, lead an historical right wing movement. So it's a cope, but anyway, I'm an incel. I am a proud incel, and uh, when I'm good and ready, I'll get married. I'll still be an incel, though. Other notable mentions are America's frontline doctors who spread inaccuracies ranging from the ineffectiveness of masks to claims that hydroxychloroquine could cure COVID-19 like Trump, yeah, what Trump said, and whose founder was sentenced to 60 days in prison for taking part in the Capitol storming, and Project Veritas, an American far-right activist group founded by James O'Keefe in 2010. The group produces deceptively edited videos of its undercover operations which use secret recordings. One group that is particularly scary is White Lives Matter, which described itself as dedicated to promotion of the white race and taking positive action as a united voice against issues facing our race. It's a neo-Nazi reactionary movement to Black Lives Matter, and when you look at the things being preached by its members, it's actually terrifying to think that this group has a support base. I'll let you see for yourself. The other thing that I think is weird about this movement is just the sheer lack of creativity. I mean, obviously I know that that's not a big deal compared to the actual ideas that they're spreading, but it just, like, there was Black Lives Matter, and then there was All Lives Matter, and now there has to be White Lives Matter. Like, I don't know, surely you could just be like, white, I don't know, even like if they said white lives are better, or 
I don't know, they could have just been a little bit more creative, you know, like, they're just copying at this point. I watched a really good TED talk by Megan Phelps Roper, who is the woman who hosts the witch trials of JK Rowling, and she did a TED talk called I Grew Up in the Westboro Baptist Church and Here's Why I Left, and she had a really interesting part where she was talking about how to have effective conversations and debates which she says are firstly don't assume bad intent I think we often go into these conversations assuming that they are malicious and they're out to get us um secondly ask questions which helps us map the disconnect between our different points of view thirdly stay calm her quote this quote really really stuck out to me she says I thought that my rightness justified my rudeness I think just let that sink in for a moment because I think this is something that we all genuinely everybody has done in, in a debate unless maybe maybe not everybody maybe I'm just really hot-headed I am a Scorpio but um yeah, I, I think that, yeah, we often, I think staying calm is such a difficult thing when you, especially when you start assuming bad intent. And fourthly, she says, fourthly, is that a thing? Lastly, lastly, she says, make the argument, because sometimes we assume that the value of our position is obvious and we don't even need to defend our positions. Like, it's not our problem if they don't understand our point of view, so we don't actually say what we think we don't even make the line of argument. We've created such a tense and polarized environment for our discussions. And although polarization can be healthy, Stephen Levitsky warns that when parties view their rivals as enemies or existential threats, they grow tempted to use any means necessary, including violence, election fraud, and military groups to defeat them. This is really threatening to democracy. If we can understand that everyone is a product of their upbringing and creation, then we can remove the judgment from our discussions and avoid widening the gap between us and them. Of course, I say this as if it's easy, it's not. Boy, do I know it. Sometimes it's literally so exhausting to have to explain yourself to someone who seems to lack even an ounce of empathy from your side. I mean, I've left debates with misogynistic boys crying because I was just so desperate for them to understand what I was trying to say. But it takes courage and resilience to speak your truth, and with practice it does become easier. This is why I've committed so strongly to reading so much theory, um, because I know that I can be confident and grounded in the knowledge that I know my stuff and I can back myself up with an array of different points. This allows me to stay calm and avoid getting defensive, which is something that I really, really struggle with. At the end of the day, when we are passionate about things, it's because we think that it's the right thing, no matter how misguided that can be. So approaching our discussions with empathy and the intent of inclusion is the only way to bridge our divides. Thank you so much for watching. It really, again, means so much that people actually want to listen to what I have to say. So thank you again. Um, start a discussion in the comment section. I'm sure that there'll be things that people agree with and don't disagree with. Um, follow my Instagram if you like, it's in the description, and I always link all of my resources in the description, so they're all there if you want to have a dive in, um, but yeah, thank you so much, I hope you have a wonderful week, and I will see you next time, bye!